What is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live Epino episode. Oh, Hello. three and it right off the top. I don't know what happened there. My lips went numb. It's because it's so cold. It is. It is cold uh, <laughs> here in the Pacific Northwest. Episode three seventy six. Tonight should be super fun. We have a good friend of ours, Devin Yanko, joining us on the show. And I, I was kind of thinking about this leading up to the show and uh, themes that we we can chat about tonight. There's so much we can catch up with Devin about. But perhaps there's sort of the underlying theme of making lemonade. Um, the reality is Devin has had a ton of pretty amazing life changes, as well as a recent experience at Heavily 100, having to DNF at mile 40. But learning from that and like looking at it as opportunity is just such an amazing perspective that from especially from the front of the pack, uh, I think we can take a lot from and learn from. So tonight we're going to talk to Devin about all what's going on in her life, uh, traveling, the bakery, everything, and what happened at Havelina and maybe how we can uh, learn from her experience there. So it's going to be a super fun show. Welcome everyone to Ginger Runner Live, episode 376. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 376. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Tuesdays to spend a little bit of it with us. Uh, fun show tonight. I'm very excited about our guest. Uh, every time we have her on, it's lively conversation that Kim and I, I mean, there's going to be laughing. There's probably going to be some really uh, just amazing sort of deep dives into things. We're going to learn a lot. Um, our guest, Devin Yanka, will be joining us here in just a couple of seconds to talk all about what's going on in her life. So there's been tons of life changes from the bakery, yes. selling the bakery, moving. We'll find out more about this whole process and, and all these big life changes. Uh, but very recently, Devin uh, attempted the Heavily 100 uh, this last weekend. And unfortunately, at mile 40, had to DNF. But we say unfortunate. I don't think she'll look at it as an unfortunate uh, experience. She's very enlightened when when it comes to these sort of things. And I can't wait to sort of dig into her brain and why she might be looking at it as an opportunity and perhaps uh, a setback as a setup for success. Kim hates it when I say that. <laughs> but I think tonight is one of those uh, episodes where we're going to be able to chat with someone who uh, front of the pack elite runner and kind of find out what a DNF is like for them. Um, but of course, before we introduce Devin, it's not just uh, myself and Devin. We also have Kim. Hi. Hello. How are you? Doing good. I Hi, introduce everyone. you different every time now. <laughs> you actually did a pretty good job this time. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Kim Tashima Newberry here. As always, uh, I will be in the chat room for the next hour. So if you have questions for Devin, you can ask them there. If you're new, pop in, say hi. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We also like to shout out members of our community uh, at the top of every show. It is because of them that we're able to do these live shows. We do Ginger Runner Live every Monday or Tuesday. And then we have daily live streams as well called Daily Brew uh, that we get to do for our GR crew. Our GR crew uh, is basically a community of people from around the world uh, over at patreon.com slash the Ginger Runner. It is because of them that we're able to do all of this. And it's uh, we're very, very thankful. Three individuals in particular at that top tier we like to shout out at the beginning of every Ginger Runner Live episode, just to say a hearty thank you to all three of them. Uh, Brian Sands, longtime supporter. Brian Sands, truly inspiring individual, um, has run multiple ultras now, is training for some pretty big races coming up next year, but he's a huge part of our community and, as I mentioned, very inspiring. Um, Rick Bjarnison as well, a ultra runner out of British Columbia, Canada. Uh, Rick and his company, CheekyMonkeyMedia.ca. They redid the gingerrunner.com website uh, a few years back, and it uh, they're maintaining it now. That's what they do. They do websites and uh, web maintenance. Uh, but Rick himself is an ultra runner and just super talented. We appreciate him very much. And finally, Brendan Coral, our good friend from down under. Brendan Coral out of Australia is a huge supporter, huge member of the community. We absolutely love him. Uh, works at an amazing brewery down in mm -hmm. Australia as well, which is always really cool uh, to talk to him about that. But he always uh, he likes us to mention the Yu Yang's race down in Australia. If you ever find yourself wanting to travel to Australia or race in Australia, the Yu Yang's race is one of those races that he's preparing for multiple distances, including the 100 miler, which he is training for for 2025. Uh, pretty exciting to follow his journey. So big shout out to those three individuals at the top tier and to all of our GR crew. We appreciate you all very much. Uh, without further ado, let's just get into this because... Um, We've been waiting to chat with Devin for quite some time. She's mm -hmm. had a bunch of life changes. So let's just get into it and find out what's been going on uh, in Devin's life. Devin Yanko. Yay. Hi. 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 Uh, I think we have Hi. frozen video on our end. Don't worry. We can still oh. hear you. 
Uh, we see your face, but we also hear your voice. So hello, Devin. Am How I, are you? I hope I'm frozen with a really awkward look on my face. Uh, <laughs> it's actually, you just look very serious. Yeah, you look. You, it, what's funny is like it's like, hey, Devin, how are you? And your face is just saying, I'm fine. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty subtle. I'll fix it on that my is, end. But. Okay, I think that's probably just Airbnb uh, Wi-Fi. Oh, in the <laughs> got it. That's probably yeah. it. But your audio is great. Yeah, your the, audio is I great. I could go. I think I could probably like stand outside or something and. You know, you'd get me back. Or if it needs to stop watching YouTube videos about fly tying. <laughs> I mean, that that could be it. It could be just the the YouTube internet stream. But basically right now it's uh, it's like in a news broadcast where they have the photo of the individual <laughs> calling in live Great. from the Airbnb. But I think at some point the video will <laughs> click back on. So we'll wait for that to happen. So. We'll, Hi, we'll how hope. are you? Uh, I'm great. Now I'm super self-conscious about the awkward look on my face as I'm talking to you with no video, but that's fine. It's okay. It's as totally, I, it's totally I, I'm okay. I'm not self-conscious. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it, it looks great. I think you could always try turning your camera off and turning it back on. Maybe that'll work. Let's, I am like never Skype. So I'm like afraid of imploding the internet but we can try let's see yeah and skype is also one of those programs now that i think microsoft has just decided to forget i think they're basically like we're just gonna yeah. let it be whatever it is okay let's okay. hope for the best How's we did okay. it success okay 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 good sorry sorry people on the internet I apologize. We can always edit that in post. Uh, everyone who's watching live got the perk. We'll just edit it so we're <laughs> both frozen also. <laughs> we're going to just do this episode all with that like awkward look on our face. Just That's great. Like crazy hand. Yeah, there we go. That's it's just. Yes. Weird, this is weird. how I live my life. Basically. It's just frozen in an awkward fo race photo. Hello. You, you mentioned that you are uh, at an Airbnb. So are you. What's going on in Devin's life that, that brings you to an Airbnb? It sounds like you're traveling a lot. Sounds like I'm homeless. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, where do I begin? Uh, yes, I am currently in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. Okay. Um, with my husband, Nathan, and my cat, Peanut. She has um, gone from never leaving our house in San Anselmo to turning into a super adventure cat. She has road tripped out here and gone fishing with Nathan and uh yeah so oh she even went to Independence Pass the day it closed so um <laughs> Peanut has been to Independence Pass more recently than I have <laughs> what an the, adventurous cat yeah, should we have the cat yeah. on this show as well <laughs> yeah. like we have uh, a... yeah it, it, she, she's into her six like six hours into her an hour nap right now so she'll uh maybe next time I'm sure <laughs> if she wakes up halfway through the show just let her know she can. Yeah, talk. we'll just mic her up. Yeah, we'll mic her up. We're totally open to that. We'll just freeze her as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. A little poly. Like this. <laughs> um, so let, let's just start there because life changes are, I mean, they're always really interesting to talk about, let alone during a pandemic. But like we're talking big changes. So I, I'm curious if we can chat a little bit about the bakery and the move. As long as I've known you, you've lived in Northern California. You've had this bakery. It's an I guess I have to say past tense. It is a, an amazing bakery uh, that we would visit every time we were in the region. Yeah. So what sort of circumstances led to this big life change, These this big choice to sell and move? Yes. Um, you guys get the inside scoop because as I told you before the show, like we hadn't really talked about it anywhere. And that was in part because of the nature of the sale. We uh, The new owner is carrying things on um, as same as it ever was in the capacity that they can. But part of that for people who are in Marin can be, I don't know if this is also elsewhere, but like if we on the day of the say, we're like, peace out, I can guarantee you like the next day, somebody be like, everything's different. You're like, it's all the same staff and it's everything's all the same people. The same. So right. we kind of just wanted to, uh, this is my move right now. I'm glad the video is working. Cause this is just kind of, I was like, you know, I, uh, <laughs> as I, I termed it, I vaguestagrammed a lot. I'd be like, oh, look, we went sailing on a ship, sailing off into the sunset. This is so symbolic. And like, I'm not really talking about what I'm talking about. Um, so <clears throat> I guess the long story is uh, we owned the bakery since 
oh geez, 2013. Um, and wow. in 20, uh, we had some very good friends who lived in the Bay Area with us, Brett and Larissa, who owned SFRC, uh, wow. Kristen and Galen Brill. And first Kristen and Galen left and then Brett and Larissa sold SFRC and they moved to Colorado. And it was at that point that we kind of were like, well, we kind of stayed here and did this because of that friend group. Um, and so we like started looking into at the beginning, we put the business on the market at the beginning of 2019. So, you know, we were killing it. Like we were that long you know, ago. When, wow. Turns out it takes a long time to sell a bakery, especially when there's a pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, we went through that whole process and we were slated to close on the sale on March 21st of 2020. Oh my God. Day, so, like day one of the pandemic, like basically. Yeah. So um, if you kind of like think about it in hindsight, like the smiley, happy face of like, hey, now Nathan and I are going to lay up all our employees and work so hard all on our own. Like there's also the undercurrent of this, like, also, our entire like life plan and trajectory just flew out the window and yeah. like is no more. And because the number of people that knew about the sale was very small, um, it was like really hard for us because we're like, well, our life just fell apart, but we can tell no one. Yay. Yeah. Right. And like we have yeah. to kind of like and <clears throat> and there was no like there's like nobody knew anything. Right. So initially it was easy because we were just like, dig in, keep working. Like don't go from like having a robust business to sell to like perishing in the pandemic. So like that part was easy, but you know, when we brought back our employees, like, and things stabilized in the like weird in between new normal that like the second half of last year was really hard because then you're like, okay, like, are we selling? Are we staying? Like that nether realm is, <clears throat> I mean, so <laughs> when I told my coach Mario, like oh, three days before the sale about what was happening, he's like, oh, now I understand why both of your legs broke, you know, Cause uh. like oh. that stress, just like that's so unknown, like holding all that in, not, you know, working really hard, having all that existen existential stress. is just like a lot. Yeah. Um, and so thankfully, you know, we have a friend of ours who's like a great, he's our broker. He's a former ultra runner as well. Like Randy just really stayed on it. And the same owner, like the, the now owner, he never went away. It was just like, we'll see how things go. And like, if the pandemic ever ends, like maybe we can talk about it. So that's basically been the process of this year. Like, being like, okay, like things are going, like we're doing really well. Like we are doing better than 90% of restaurants. Like we really <clears throat> didn't have, like we really survived quite well. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, if we can survive that, like that kind of shows how robust the business is. Um, it would have been nice if it had been like magic wand, bing, like just like everything goes. It's so simple. We were so close. Like it's, not how it works, but um, mostly because of we had a very terrible landlord. So oh. that was, you know, drew out the. That's my second broken leg is probably just <laughs> because of our <laughs> the landlord. Um, but <clears throat> so we got that like back on, you know, back going, and we sold at the end of August. Um, okay. So we did like a month of training, and like you know, we. The nice thing was this sounds really weird. The nice thing was is like as anybody who, I don't know, has left their house in the last six months knows, like the world is short staffed. And at the beginning of June, we had a lot of turnover like everybody else. So it was actually nice because we had the opportunity to bring in, like, it was like almost like non-sentimental, right? So by the time we sold the business, the people, we had like, I, the day we went in, we went in to tell the kitchen staff and I was like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm the owner, except uh, for now I'm going to tell you I'm not the owner anymore. So my, you know, like, you know, so it kind of made, it was nice in that regard yeah. um, to kind of bring in new people, but not have some of the same, like <clears throat> we had only like a handful of staff that was like, OGs, you know? So like over, yeah. 
it's like we were able to train people into the style of what we do and the food and like the bread and everything. Um, and then, you know, hand things off and here we are that a puts months later. Yeah. That puts a ton into perspective too. When we uh, last had you on the show, cause when we last had you on the show, you had like just figured out the leg injury and the things that were really setting you back and training was on the up and up. And like you were, uh, I remember the, tra the trajectory is like looking at the circumstances you were in and you were really excited about the next few stages. I had no idea that all of this was going on in the background. I mean, no one did it. Right. And yeah. we have some people in the chat that are sort of, we're sort of recognizing uh, that not having people to talk to or not really being able to open up about some of the things that are causing you the most stress. That's a really difficult thing. Very difficult thing. Uh, yeah. And especially during a pandemic where everyone's already dealing with a certain level of stress as it is. So I, it's amazing to sort of hear this and then think back to that episode. I'd be curious to go back and, yeah. and watch just knowing what you're dealing with. You might you're... find some uh, omissions in there. <laughs> but, it's, but it's also like, it's exactly what a human would do, right? Like, I can't really open up about these things that are yeah. happening. Just can't. Yeah. Um, but uh, it would be interesting to go back purely from the standpoint of, oh, yeah, you're injured. And it's probably all this stress and it's probably all this other stuff that is all coming together now that we're hearing what, what was actually going on behind the scenes. Um, so where you're at now, essentially bakery sold, uh, were you able to pack up the car and uh, I'm assuming you left the, left the area, you're on the move now? Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to leave the area. I mean, I think circumstances would have been different if we could have afforded to live in that area. Sure. But essentially for lack of a, we were always going to be the help, right? Like we, we couldn't, we were going to get, if we even tr could have had the amount of money to try and buy a house in Marin, we would have just get, got outbid by tech people like ridiculously. Right. So that was a big driver. It's just kind of like, not really cool to feel like an outsider in your own community. Um, so two weeks plus a couple days ago, we put all of our stuff into a pod. Um, we have packed up our life into the most like insane jigsaw, like three dimensional puzzle. It's <laughs> there was some of the, the amount of stuff Nathan got in the last 5%. I, I just, I can't even like, I, I walked out and I saw it and I was like, Nope, no, nope. can't look at that. Nope. No. <laughs> there's like, like there's the element you... of like, just throw everything in. And then there's also yeah. the, if we're strategic about this, we can get <laughs> everything in. Yes. And I had done like the first 80%, right? Like my librarian brain and like my ability to see three dimensional spaces, like really good, right? Like I looked at what we had and I was like, bam, bam, this is where the furniture goes. This is how it has to work. Yeah. And then like, then there was like the last like really weird shaped objects and like the stuff that were like, yeah, if it makes it great, if it doesn't. And Nathan's like, all right, I'm going to manhandle this. Um, <laughs> and he did. Uh, mostly everything made it um, into the pod. So as for where we are moving, people, pe the first question people always ask me is like, oh, so where are you moving? And when are you opening another bakery? And I'm like, or I'm going to like sleep yeah. for three months. But thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would have been a, would have been a better strategy than trying to run 100 miles. Let me tell you, <laughs> as, as I was. I was standing on our dining room table in the pod with like one foot on, I don't know what it was, but it was probably dangerous. It was Nathan. In like a, <laughs> it was, it was an, in a half squat. No, Nathan was outside push and I was holding our mattress above my head, sliding it like in over the top. And I was like, I don't think my competitors are doing the same things right now. Maybe running a hundred miles was a bad idea, but you know, I don't think it was the move that I don't know, you know? So, um, we have not decided where we're moving. Cool. Hence the like weird like Airbnb pod situation. So we have enough stuff for an indeterminate amount of time with indeterminate activities for all seasons. You know, like we we're kind of like we don't want to rush into the next decision. We want to take our time and we want to like explore. You know, we have some like parameters obviously for where we want to live um some states 
in some places it's just like, no, nah. like everybody was like, Oh, are you moving to Arizona? I was like, sorry, it got red sharpied because there's not enough fly fishing. Sorry. You know, like <laughs> just, <laughs> no, I'm not moving to Arizona. Um, so we're very interested in Colorado. That's why we started here. Um, but who knows? We are as, as two non-spontaneous, like not, um, footloose and fancy free people. We are, Sponta- we're being spontaneous and footloose and fancy free currently. See, I love that. To the best though. of our ability. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this is something Kim and I talk about, I mean, very often. And we, we bring it up on the show a lot with guests who are, who are go- undergoing big life changes and things like that. We cannot do anything but commend people on making like purposeful decisions like this because it, it takes a lot to go, my life as it is currently, my job, my career, my relationship, whatever it is, as it is currently it could be fulfilling. It could be the best thing in the world, but it, maybe you want something different. And that's a really hard pivot to make uh, at any stage in life. You could be 19 years old and it's difficult. You could be 50 years old and it's difficult. So uh, it is a huge, yeah, basically, I want to commend you and, and Nathan for making such a big change. And it's such a cool, adventurous one where you you don't necessarily know where those roots are going to plant next. And that's a really cool thing. I can imagine... Yeah its influence on your running is, if anything, a bit haphazard. So like, have you been able to get training in? Uh, have you been able to do your regular mileage in a week? Or like, how's the body been holding up? Like, let's, let's start there before we to, uh, have a look. Uh, I mean, it, it was a miracle um, leading up to Havelina with moving that week was like my peak, peak week. Like I wow. did a... Uh, 25 mile run on Friday, the day before we packed up our pod. So like I did my, and so I had mentioned I was injured after my last interview, I got injured again. Um, which was like the freakiest, like literally if there is a human who can explain to me that this has happened to somebody else, I tore a ligament that everybody was like, how did you do that? So I tore my femoral ligament in my hip. So essentially the ligament that holds your hip until your pelvis, it's like, you know, just tore that right off. Ow. Um, and it caused a stress fracture, like right at the top of my femur on my other leg. Um, the pers- the cause, mm. I mean, it's, it, I think it's because, so Tyler Andrews, uh, who's, where I work with at Chosky and he runs for Hoka. He's, he came in, uh, he won the hundred K at Havilland this past weekend. Yeah. Really good dude. He and I put together a 50 K race on the track, uh, in May, I believe it was May. So we had like a local, like the Tamalpins, like old school Tamalpin runners, like came together, put together a race for us so we could qualify for the world championships. Wow. So I ran, 14 weeks after I had started running. So like 14 weeks after we talked, I ran a 50 K on the track and I ran a qualifying time. I, who knows if I like, so I ran a 327, which was, uh, basically after mile five, I ran the remaining 25 miles faster than I had done any of my training. Basically, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. it was my co- cause Mario, my coach paced me for 15 miles and he was like, every mile you've just run way farther than you had done in this entire training block. It was ridiculous, but it turned out that that track, and it sounds really strange to say this, that track was really long and narrow. So the turns were really tight. Um, and actually Mario also had a problem on his left side that lasted for many weeks after. So my hip on my left side is what ended up going out. Um, so that was, uh, probably not the best idea. And then I found out, like, I think it was Western States weekend. I found out that they had canceled worlds. So I was like, great. Uh, I I was, I, you know, like I had been like, like i not been injured in my like 15 year career, right? Like I, other than like the freak broken foot, like, like this year has been, I mean, now, like I said, it explains it like the level of stress and like not actually having anywhere for that to go. Um, But that was like a, a little bit like, Ooh, like, damn, I don't even like, I can't even be like, I'll just come back from this and win a world championship. It was like, there is not even, it doesn't even matter. (laughs) Um, 
I, well, so, I mean, what a hard pill to swallow too. Like to, to put so much effort into it to to wreck your body, and then to have that news break too is just it's just frustration after frustration, right? Yeah, yeah. I I mean, it was like kind of like I was in a hotel room by myself, like in Olympic Valley, because I was up there to help. I run far with their coverage, and I like look at my phone, and I was like, okay. We're we're okay. We're fine. We're just oh, gonna, man. Uh, uh, I'm gonna watch other people run. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> just gotta put on the smile. Gotta put on the smile. Like you're doing great. Everyone's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really long way of going. So basically, my training for Havelina. So Havelina would have been 15. It was 15 weeks after I started running again. So my peak week and my highest mileage all year, which was like about 110 miles, was the week I packed up my pod. So I think I get a, like a, I don't know, 15% boost for all the lifting and <laughs> shoving and like, so. All, all I mean, of this. Yeah, all, all of, that. of that. This is exactly <laughs> how I pack. <laughs> Uh, over here. <laughs> yeah. over there. No, like there were moments where I like staring at a wall of boxes and I'm and Nathan would come out and be like, Shh, I'm visualizing <laughs> where the boxes go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, my training all, I mean, I think it best reflected through like other people's eyes. Like other people would look at my training and be like, how are you running that fast? Like this soon. And like, that was the thing that really surprised me is that, I felt like I came back like really like I came back in the same like methodical way. I took my time, even though everybody and their uncle was like, you're an injured person now. Maybe you're just going to have to change what you're doing, which was really annoying. Mm -hmm. Really like I'm like, actually, it's stranger that I did the same thing over and over again for 15 years and then suddenly got injured. So I don't think it's what I was doing that was, you know, the problem. <laughs> um so my training went as good as it can for like 15 weeks. It was, I kind of had to put blinders on and like not pay attention to like people that I knew who were racing the same race and be like, oh, look, I just ran three minutes on times eight, you know, and they're like running 30 miles, you know, you're like, fine. Yeah. Fine. But like I, so my training, I did a FKT um, in Yosemite about, four weeks before Havelina, which is like kind of what I like. My favorite phrase that I've just made up is like apropos of nothing because the loop was nothing having to do with Havelina at all. I just had wanted to do it before I left California and I was supposed to do it last year. Um, so the High Sierra Camp Loop is 48 miles. And again, nothing like Havelina. It's at altitude. It's like, you know. Pretty technical. I'm sure rocky. and <laughs> Yeah. My slowest mile was downhill coming off clouds rest. <laughs> because <laughs> they're like i'm going to die i'm going to die like you're just like for an entire mile you're like if i, I literally am just going to smash my face into a rock um so i set the fkt i was super stoked how well my body held up but i had run my longest run of this build up the week before which was 28 miles and then i went to 48 miles and i was like okay we're just gonna coast on in after this right yeah, like yeah <laughs> it's not exactly so I think the context is for coming off an injury, my, my training went amazing and I felt, I feel very fit. It's also like, uh, I had talked to Addie Bracey. I had interviewed her on our podcast. Um, and like the day before I went up to Yosemite and I basically was like, not to turn this podcast into a therapy session, but how do I do this? Because like, I have no context for like coming off an injury and having like confidence. And I don't, you know, like I don't, I've never had to make that turn. Um, and so she was super helpful and it kind of, I just reframed it as like, this is a new experience. And so taking that forward to Havelina, instead of being like, you know, like people would be like, Oh, go, go get the course record, you know, break your own course record, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like hard pump the brakes. Like that's not even yeah, like, in my, like what I'm thinking about, like, I am thinking about like, I would, my goal was to run, to get a golden ticket. Like I just wanted to put myself in the position and see if that was possible coming off what I was doing. And like, I felt going into it. Well, basically until a week before the race, I felt great. <laughs> and so it was like, 
I went in with that confidence of like, I don't know what's going to happen. I have experience here. Like I am an experienced runner and I'm just going to like have a day. My favorite phrase that now I see everybody using is have a day. So like that's my, was my attitude going into the race. I think, you know, I think getting all this context leading up to Havelina actually puts a lot more into context to sort of, you know, we're, we're guilty of, of looking at Havelina this weekend and, and being like, man, I, I hope Devin does really well. And I hope that, uh, she puts on, you know, the race of her life and that sort of thing, not knowing the context of everything. And that's, yeah, that's how it goes with a lot of elites <clears throat> that you see toe the line of these big races is sometimes you don't know the whole story. You don't know the whole story. Yeah. Um, and in this case, clearly, <clears throat> uh, you've been dealing with a lot for a very long time, let alone injury. You know, we've talked with you before about injury, coming back from injury and how methodical you are. So to know that you towed the line at all, of course, that's a huge success. I am curious. I do want to dig in a little bit more into um, psychological aspects of towing a line to a race with health issues, knowing that like <clears throat> golden ticket is the goal, but also maybe just finishing is also a goal. Uh, we'll get to that here in just a second. I do want to get to some of these live questions because we're live with Devin Yanko. Kim, you pulled a couple aside. What do we got? Yeah, so you've talked uh, a bit about all life stressors and everything like that leading up to the race. Uh, Deb runs far in the chat asks, with all the crazy changes going on, was towing the line at Havelina motivated by maybe a goal for a physical stress relief? That's a great question. And actually, similar to what my therapist asked me. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> my, actually my therapist, uh, FYI, shout out to therapy. Therapy is amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, my therapist is, we talk a lot about running and like, he's very curious about like why I run the way I do. Um, and I did have this realization the, a couple weeks before the race that although my motivations have changed and like my relationship with running has changed dramatically, <clears throat> it's also like Physically, it actually is really good for me. Um, so I have my therapy, I have been diagnosed with PTSD and I've always wondered why the act of running is like super helpful for my nervous system, right? So like, it's always been like that question of like, why do you run? Like, why do you run these crazy distances? And I'm like, I don't know. It like makes me feel better. And like, no matter like what my actual like thinking brain is doing, it actually does really help my body. Um, and so Havelina, it was kind of like, one, it's like a big challenge, but it's also like that I am very drawn to the ultra distances for that reason. Like that is a physical outlet for stress. It also, it kind of takes away some of the, like the, the part that your thinking brain can't remove, right? Like, obviously I, was like well aware that I was stressed out, but I'm like not able to process it. So I do think that that was there. Um, also like it, I mean, like one of the like, bare basics of <clears throat> the goal was like, I have been planning for the last two years to do the grand slam. And when they announced like my fall plan coming off of injury was actually very different. Um, I had originally intended to run JFK 50 mile. But like when they announced the golden tickets, I was like, I would like to give myself the most opportunities to get into Western States. And so with Havelina, especially as a hundred miler, I kind of felt like, you know, like that's in my wheel wheelhouse coming off injury more than like, you know, a 50 mile is coming up. It's kind of a weird thing to say. Like, I feel more confident running a hundred miles than I do 50, but <laughs> that, that was part of the motivation. <laughs> Uh, I want to to start to dig in here to how the race played out for you. So you you mentioned there in, in the pre-show a little bit about towing the line and and just with underlying health issues and things like that. I'm I'm curious how that beginning part of the day went. Uh, you you obviously have the course record or had the course record on this course, which is just bonkers for many many years, and you're very well known at Havelina for having that and having had such great performances. So coming back towing the line. Uh, what did you have in your mind as far as goals or what opportunity did you want to give yourself stuff like that? What was sort of going through your mind? Well, there's two things. And one thing that is hilarious to me is it's a very ultra runner, th ultra running thing to be like, Oh, of course, like my course, the course that I ran is very different than the course that we just ran this weekend. Oh, like, interesting. It's, I mean, I'm not saying like my, like Camille would have freaking shattered it no matter what. Right. Like, but the course I ran 
I know it's weird to be like, on a relatively flat course, there's a hard way and an easy way. This way, I was like, hell yeah, we get to do the super highway. Like you do the rocky part on the up. So it's a different course. Like fundamentally, it's two miles shorter, which nice little bonus there for anybody. So I was oh, like, yeah. my course record's going down eventually, right? Like <laughs> I, that was my number one motivation when people would be like, how do you feel about it? I'm like, at least I don't have to run those extra two miles, right? Like, <laughs> um, so like that's a, it's very funny in ultra running just that like we compare these things and it's like, no one's ever going to be able to quantify the difference, but they are 100%. different. They're, you yeah. know, and like, I, I knew that, I mean, I know Camille's been wanting to break the course record for many years and it was like super awesome to, you know, talking about like, in the vein of like struggling and then coming back, like she's had some struggles. And so like going into this, it was like, she's going to nail something so probably sooner rather than later. And it was cool to watch her do that. I mean, watch her. I didn't see her at all. <laughs> <laughs> Never, saw her. Never saw her until I was at the finish watching people finish in my unicorn onesie in this sick shirt. Um, it is <laughs> um, as for the race itself. So even before I lined up um, earlier that week, so the week before I had, I had left and come to Arizona, uh, I was in Flagstaff and I felt great, mm -hmm. right? Like I ran, like my last long run, I ran on Lake Mary and I ran 640 pace, like at 7,000 feet of altitude, even though I'm not adapted. And I was like, damn, I'm ready. I'm good. Like I'm at altitude and I'm not acclimatized. I'm ready. So I apparently am a weird person because then I went to sea level and like on Tuesday I went for a run and I was like, I think I'm dead. I think I'm dying. Like I literally would come to like a 10 foot hill and like, I was like, something's wrong because I would have to like walk up the tiniest hill. Oh, no. Um, and everybody, God bless everybody, you know, who was like, <laughs> Oh, you're just having, you're just having taper crazies. And I was like, no nah, dog that's not what this is right like <laughs> taper, taper crazies you feel like crap and then you go for a run and you're like okay maybe i'm a little off like i i legit you know for as positive my attitude is after the fact that is not how i felt I, mario might be watching this he could attest that i was basically freaking not in the that place F yeah. out uh yeah i like because i was like am i sick i mean i took three covid tests in the four days before the race. Like I oh. went to urgent care. I had a like flu test, all this stuff. I was like, I don't know if I can start. And ultimately what we decided was like, you won't know how you feel unless you start. Right. And even the day before, and I, it's really funny because I read this article by Alex Nichols on I run far today about people who are like at the expo, like making free excuses. And I was like, yeah, that was yeah. me. Every yeah. time somebody was like, oh, you feeling ready? And I'm like, nope, <laughs> I feel like I'm dying. <laughs> and like, that's a really hard position mentally to be in because like, I feel like I would never tell somebody to line up for a hundred miler if you're not like all the way committed to make it to the finish, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a dangerous <laughs> it's a dangerous mentality, right? But the context is, is like, mo I don't know what percentage of people know that I suffer from like several chronic illnesses and autoimmune disorders. And so when people are like, oh, taper crazies, I was like, no, like, I don't think you understand this flavor of fatigue, right? I was like, so you've been in the basement, like you've been had the flu and you like went into a sub basement. I was like, my sub basement, it has like 27 levels, right? Like yeah. people who have never felt that way, like it's hard to explain. Like I just started being like, have you ever had mono? And people were like, no. And I'm like, then I can't even give you. <laughs> yeah, then, then, then there's no context. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's like that. And there's no recourse because of these diseases that I suffer from, it's like, what is it? Did I get some like low grade virus, which is why I kept testing myself because I was like, my body just reacts very strongly. So I was like, am I really sick? Did I just, you know, I basically kept being like, did I just fuck this up? Is the gist of it? Like did the move, the altitude, like, did I just do this wrong? Right. Like, mm -hmm. did I just get unlucky? Like Mario had said, like back when I told him and I wanted to do this, he was like, 
this could go very long, like given like what you like the way this timeline is going to go. It's like, that is a risk, right? Like moving is very hard on the body. And I was like, I'll be fine. Fine. <laughs> what can happen? I'll just break another femur. I have to, it's fine. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like I knew that it was a risk. It was just like really frustrating to have that happen you know, to like literally feel so good, so close to the race and then just yeah. like be like, nope. Um, and to if this gives you a perspective, I so Corinne Malcolm came out to crew me um, and Amelia Boone crewed me and another person. I actually told my pacers not to come. So I had two people who were going to come and pace and mm-hmm. I felt so poorly. Like I was like, I love you. I don't like I'm not going to ask you to fly from California to show up and watch me like potentially stop and they're like oh but we want you know if you're starting we want to be there and I was like I can't guarantee you that there's like like I don't want you to stay in house with me I don't want you to be touching my bottles like if I have a cold and like I just didn't feel like comfortable with that and like like I said I went to urgent care and they're like you're fine (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they tested me for everyone that that girl scrubbed my brain so hard with those q-tips it's like um <laughs> you know like she's like well I don't know what's wrong with you but it's you don't have like I don't I she wasn't worried that I had a virus and that's you know for me also just like I didn't feel comfortable not knowing like lining up at start line like I don't want to be that asshole who's like ah, I might have COVID here we are yeah, <laughs> yeah. right like, you know, like, I don't, even if, like, there, there weren't COVID protocols for the race, like, even if that's the case, like, I still have, a like, a moral imperative to kind of feel like, no, this is, like, on my own personal, like, I very much felt like this is just something that's happening to my body, and I'm fine, like, I'm, I'm fine for being around other people. Um, so, lining up at the start line, like, I... I mean, I was worried because I was like, I don't, I'm, I didn't start on the start line being like, I'm running a hundred miles. I started on the start line, like I'm running 20 miles and seeing how I feel, mm. you know? And like, yeah. we kind of like, I talked to Mario and Corinne was there and Corinne's also a coach, you know, she's, you know, my friend, but she's also a coach. So she's like a, and she's not like a cuddly little bear. who's going to be like, you're fine. Right. Yeah. She's <laughs> like, not going to give. Yeah. <laughs> coddle you she's not gonna gonna coddle you she's gonna give it to you straight yeah and so like I felt like between her and Amelia they had a good perspective on like I'm like I don't I don't want you to let me talk myself out of this for normal like 100 mile stuff but I do want you to respect my decision if I say like I shouldn't be doing this Mm -hmm. um and that's you know like it's a it is a hard like in hindsight I'm glad I lined up, but it's also like, I also recognize that that was not, it's not the mentality I'd like to start out with. Right. Like I want to be on the start line. Like I'm about to crush some shit and I feel great. And like, I'm willing to like work the problems and fight to the end. And like, ultimately I lined up with the attitude of like, I'm here for a golden ticket. I'm not here just to finish. And like, That is a different mentality. And I, you know, Mario and I discussed it and it was like, I'm going to take a professional approach to this, right? Like, this is not, I don't need to finish this race, clearly. Like I've set the course record. I don't, I don't need to just finish it. So I am here for a specific piece of business. And that is how I focus my attention. Mm. Um, And that is, you know, I think lining up is, I think that's what helped my perspective after the fact is like, kind of letting go to like how our community like kind of paints everything with the same brush is like the death before DNF. And I'm like, but like, that's not like the context here isn't about that. Like I didn't come here to see if I could run a hundred miles. Like I came here to get a, I came here to get a ticket so I can run four 100 milers in four months. You know, (laughs) very rational and reasonable. Goal. <laughs> it is it, i mean it's what i love about this though is you basically over the matter of a of a couple of days you sort of had to uh realign your perspective a little bit 
figure out why am I here today? Because yesterday it might have been a very different reason, but today it's because I want to see if I can get to that 20 miles and just reassess, see how the body's behaving, and then maybe we can, you know, uh, do another loop. Like you had to sort of change your perspective at the last minute. And rolling with those types of punches is, again, an important thing that we talk about on the show with people of all abilities, all levels. Uh, being able to do that can give you these new perspectives. So, um, days before you were thinking golden ticket uh i'm assuming hours or even minutes before you're probably going fuck one loop uh <laughs> when you ended up having to pull the plug so you you spoiler you managed to get two loops you got managed to get to 40 miles which is now hearing everything is like it's insane that's amazing going through your head you you, you mentioned this on instagram and this is sort of that connection that i'm really really fascinated with is uh, you mentioned in 2009 DNFing Western states and how that was just like a, uh, you know, a big disappointment for yourself and, and the place where you, you go mentally. How was this a different experience? How was it easier or was it easier to, to roll into that start finishing area and pull your bib off? Take us through the, the steps here of sort of recognizing that this DNF wasn't something to like pity yourself over, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, the nice thing was I started out and I was like, oh, I mean, like from the first few steps, I was like, I feel like significantly better than I had the last couple of days. Not necessarily like fine, but I was like, I mean, I like I was like I said, I like stood next to Camille at the start line. And then that was the last time I saw her until the finish. Right. So like I went out with. I basically was like with everybody in the men's preview, like Brittany Peterson and I were with us, we're running along and like when it finally got light enough, I was like, yeah, just so you know, we're running with all the guys who might win this race. <laughs> Except for like the, like there was like a, like four, I think there were like four guys and Camille that just were like gone, right? Off. Yeah. And so I, we had our little pack and we were just chatting and like I, it was the first time I'd met Brittany and like, like I felt I felt like I was running. I don't look at my watch at hundred mile. I literally put it on time of day. I don't look at anything. And so we're just like cruising along and like, we get like up the big hill and she was kind of like, yeah, like we are running very fast. And I was like, really? I feel like this is not that bad. And like, I look at my watch and I was like, it's fine. We're running like 13 hour pace. It's whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> we're all run. I was like to all these guys, I was like, don't worry. Just, we're just running 13 hour pace. Like to put it in perspective, like two people ran under 14 hours. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. Like, yeah. And I was like, but I also know how that course runs. Like everybody kind of preemptively runs more aggressively on the first loop because it does get hot. And so you're kind of like, you can't bank time, but you kind of can, like, you know, you're going to slow down. And then like, if you can run slightly faster on the first loop, right. Like, and then consciously slow down in the heat, then like, that is a good strategy. That's how I set a course record. That is what I did. And so I was flipping along and I was like, I think I'm fine. And like, I got, there's a section that I had never seen. And Tyler had told me, um, Tyler Andrews had told me, he's like, oh, it's terrible. It's so rocky. It's so this. And I like go through that section and I was like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Like, this is not that at all. Uh, like, so I did, you know, I, so the first loop is longer than all the other subsequent loops. So you do like just over 20 miles. And so I was like, you know, like the Brittany and like there, I think there were a couple of women who had been like right behind us. They kind of slow, they pulled back and I ended up, you know, running seven minute miles on the downhill part. <laughs> you know like I just I like I felt very comfortable I came yeah. in I saw I came in to start finish and I said to Corinne and Amelia I was like I think at the next loop I'm just gonna need like time back like I just took a, a like I said a professional approach I was like I feel fine now but like things are probably gonna change like whatever I I think even though I don't generally race with a, a, like a self, like a conscientious to where my competitors are, because I think it's just distracting. Like I wanted to know like how I was feeling, how compared to other people. So I finished that loop. They send me out with like prepared for, you know, the heat. And I got about two miles outside of the aid station. And it was like, 
somebody just like pulled, like it was literally like my, like my batteries came out or like somebody pulled the plug, like, Oh, your tether's out. And I was like, oh, oh, no. like you know, like I had been fuel, like every, I had been doing everything according to plan, like fueling fine. Everything was fine. I wasn't running too hard. Like it was just like the, the feeling of the days before it like came back. And I was like, you're fine. Everything's fine. Uh, like Courtney DeWalter <laughs> told me her, her, that she just tells herself, you're fine. We're fine. Everything's fine. So I was like, just, I'm, I, I'm channeling my Courtney. Like yep. I'm fine. And you know, I got to the next aid station, I get ice. And then I like, didn't even feel hot, but like, it was like, I could feel the creeping of like all these different factors. So it's like my energy has gone. Like all of a sudden I can't take fuel. Like I took a gel and I was like, hmm, that's coming back up. Okay. That's an interesting. That doesn't generally happen when you're like not that far into a race. Right. Um, and I, like I had all week, I had this like terrible headache and like that kind of came back and I was a little bit like, you know, you can get spacey. Like I was like a little bit spacey, lightheaded and it's like not energy, you know, it's not like calories or whatever. And I, managed to find a rock and trip on a rock and land with my knee that had been part of my first injury last year. Oh. I like fully smashed my knee into a rock and, you know, jump up. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> you know, as I'm like gushing blood, I literally, <laughs> this part of my arm is like a permanent, it should, it should be made out of metal by now because I literally always <laughs> just digger that so that's bad that's the one yeah i'm like i'm gonna land like this <laughs> um, um and i you know jumped up and i was just like okay that happened um but one of the things that i kind of came in with the attitude was like i'm not risking another injury i'm not risking my health like i've worked so hard in pt to like get my body into a place to be able to run and unfortunately like smashing my knee like that kind of triggered like up chain problems like immediately where yeah. I can recognize like my pelvis has now moved, right? And Things unless I can like find a wall and do my PT exercises, it's <laughs> not, gonna, you know, like right. my adductor, which has been kind of like is my indicator, like was starting to go and like my knee was pretty swollen. <clears throat> and then like, I'm not eat like I'm not eating. I'm not, you know, like it was just like, I don't have energy. And like at that point, like I get to Jackass Junction. So it's like 10 miles. It's like the middle of the loop. And I was like, if I could be done here, I would be done, but I'm going to like finish out the loop. But like those last 10 miles, like there was not, I didn't really have a doubt. I was just like, you, the way that we, the language that we use to describe like how it would judge this is like, at mile 20, you should feel like you run, you run 20 miles. At 40 miles, you should feel like you run 40 miles. And at that point, which is like mile 30, I was like, I feel like I've run 80 miles, right? Yeah. And it just, like, the, the way I felt when I DNF'd Western States was like, like, like deep, like self-loathing and like so much judgment and like so hard and beating myself up and all this kind of stuff. And like, I, in those last 10 miles, I was like, I just, would preferably not die, like to not die in the desert. So I'm just going to like run a pace that I could like, it's not like I slowed down that much. I went from running like eight minute pace to like nine minute pace. Sure. Um, but I just was like, I'm just, I am done. Like, I don't feel, I didn't actually, you know, and anybody who's known me for a long time knows I'm a big crier. Um, but like, I didn't have that reaction. Like when I knew that it was like, I was done, it was just like, that is what the choice I had to make on this day. Like, it's like, I'm really bummed. Like I can, what if myself and me, like if I didn't trip, would I have like, right. would I have been able to like mitigate the other things? But like with that, like the front of like things were hurting in a way that you're like, you, you know, running 60 more miles on this is not going to end well. Right. And yeah. so yeah. I, I just kind of was like, <clears throat> like Brittany, I had been, Britain, like I had been like waiting in the aid station. I was like, maybe I'll feel better if I just like have the other women pass me. <laughs> like I'm like at the aid station, like I'm just gonna hang out. And like Brittany, <laughs> fi like finally caught me, and and she's like, you're doing great. Just come with me. And I was like, nope, I'm done. And she was like, no. I was like, yeah, bye. <laughs> um, 
Um, so I finished out the loop and I come in and like the way the start finishes, we had some really nice people who let us uh, use their tent. Like we apparently showed up on time, but way too late to get a good spot for a pop tent. Yeah, you have to do a pop up. <laughs> um, so somebody let us use theirs. Like as you come in, you do like a horseshoe basically. So you come in, go through everything and then start finish and then come back out. So I come in and I see Corinne and Amelia and I just like hand them my pack and I'm like, I'm done. And Corinne's like, we can talk about it. Go to the start, finish and come back. (laughs) 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 Like I run over, I'm like running over and I like get to the start, finish and Jubilee, who's the race director, who's also just like, I literally come to the finish and I was like, I'm done. And she's like, are you? And I was like, yeah she's like I'm sorry and she like gave me a hug and I was like I think I want to be your best friend and she's like okay and I think we should be best friends <laughs> and then we just started like having this whole like conversation and I was like I think my crew's gonna try to talk me back into going and she's like do you want me to take your race number so you can't keep going <laughs> um so I like stood there for like I don't know it must have been like 10 or 15 minutes and like Finally, some of the other, like, women who I had, like, gapped. So Brittany had been ahead of me. But, like, the other women started coming through. And then I was, like, like, there was something about, like, having to be, like, no, really, like, you're you done. And, choose. like, stop yeah. thinking about this, like, what if, like, and I, and so I was just, like, I'm done. And I, like, jog. It's really awkward to, like, jog back through everything. Everybody's, like, go. And you're, like, um. <laughs> I'm not going to explain myself. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's like not reaching your goal is disappointing. Like it's a bummer, right? Like those, that set of circumstance, it is a bummer. It also doesn't have, it doesn't mean anything about who I am, right? Like it's just Mm. unfortunate. Like there was a woman in the race and she actually commented on my Instagram and it's like, she tripped at mile six and hit her head and like, blacked out multiple times and was pulled out of the race as she was going for her fifth finish. Right. Like that sucks. That has to be so hard. And that's like really bad luck. She did not, didn't fuck up her training. She didn't fuck up her feeling like there, she did not do anything wrong. She found the, the, a rock found her in the desert. And I think she like rammed her head into a cactus. <laughs> I mean, oh, I can see oh. totally like the the story that like, you know, ended up being told, but like, that's super unfortunate. And I, yeah. but that's all it is, is like a bummer. It's not a versus the way I saw the Western stage, which was like, I am a failure. Like yeah. this time I was like, well, guess we're going to go back to the house and get in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you think that's, do you think that's maturity? Or do you think that's experience? Like, do you think the mentality being so different for you, wh- how do you think you're you're able to look at it differently now? <laughs> my, my one word answer is therapy. Uh, so I think it's, it's a great answer. I, think, I mean, that's the reality is, like I said, like I have realized that some of the ways that I have operated in this world are like trauma responses and are like hmm. not like unresolved like tools I use to survive really bad shit. I'm sorry if I keep swearing and I don't know if we're, I'm allowed to, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> we're not controlled you know, by like, the FCC. <laughs> you can swear. You too. <laughs> um, so like I realize, like I look back at my career and like a lot of the ways that I, when I was younger operated were like some of those things, which were like very, they're like born, they were born out of a good place. Like I survived a lot of things, but like those, when those integrate into your personality and you don't like work through them, like wanting people to like validate me or like get my self worth from other people or like that kind of thing. Like <laughs> I didn't realize, like realize that that was something that I could fundamentally change. And so mm. w- through like, that like actually doing self work and like actual proper therapy, like just getting to a point where like, yes, it is age, but it's also just like realizing that like I was searching for these things in all the wrong places. And like, I always thought like, Oh, I'll get it out there. Like I'll do the thing and then I'll feel this way about myself. And it's like, that's not, that's not how it works. And I have felt like, over this year, just like very different about myself in the world. 
um, and like, like losing some of that self-consciousness. So I think that that really helps like when you have this kind of experience where it's like, it's just not, you know, we assign a lot of things to it that it's not right. Like yeah. not finishing a race is like not because you are a terrible human being. <laughs> like, it's just not, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that was part of my post is like, what really bothers me is when you read posts about DNFs, they're often very self-critical. And like what I see in that is, so you're saying that about yourself and I understand people are saying that about th themselves, but what other people read is that they see the judgment for themselves. They see that reflected back, right? So mm -hmm. if somebody says like, I DNF because I lack discipline, then somebody who reads that is going, did I, I thought I just DNF because I could, was uncontrollably throwing up, not because I wasn't disciplined, you know, like it, it's, you know, it's a reflection out into the world. And I think that I don't want that to be how I reflect my experience anymore. I don't want other people to see me as, you know, like me reflecting my experiences. Like I really am. A, I, I'm, I really suck because like, how are other people going to take that? Like, that's mm. like a really big bummer to me. Like, I want people to be like, I had this hard experience and like, what can I take from it? Like, how can I learn? Like, how could I do better? Not like how I felt after Western States. Turns out it was 2010 and I just have a really bad memory. So, too, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like I don't want somebody else to like spend a month beating themselves up because of this experience. Like, it's just not like, I don't think that that's how this sport should be. Like, so I am oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, Deb runs far in the chat says golden tickets are amazing, but these kinds of stories are relatable to so many of us runners struggling through ultras are the interesting, entertaining and growing experiences. And Deb earlier did also, uh, Deb is our kind of Arizona trail expert. And she did say, uh, running, I think all, is it clockwise? Is that what the way you went? Yeah, it's yes. all, all five all, or clockwork. Yeah, she said that is easier than the washing machine style. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember that. I remember being like, I feel like this shouldn't be this hard in this direction, but it. <laughs> 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 I'm glad they picked that direction at least. I, I also just want to point out that I really deeply appreciate your honesty and your sharing of this because I think it's easy um, by the way, Gus was like, not going to let us not put him. He on saw your shirt. He saw your shirt. He's like, like, I need to come I get a better a look. Uh, so he had to make his way up. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm just so appreciative of your words because it's, it's very easy as someone who's had, I had a DNF and it was one of those moments where I didn't know how to live in that moment because I was feeling such elation that I was able to do what I was able to do before I had to DNF. But then the idea of like, oh, well, isn't a DNF a failure? And I had to have that sort of internal dialogue with myself of like, what does this mean to me as a as a person? And you clearly stating that like a race does not define who we are. A result does not define who we are. Um, we have to kind of discover that, that like these races, these adventures, these things that we choose to do do not define us. They enrich us. And they help us learn more about ourselves. And I think you relaying the story, um, th this is why I wanted to have you on the show today, is because you are one of the fastest out there. Uh, you can compete with the best of them. You've had a number of things happen in the last couple of years that uh, injury related and the autoimmune uh, uh, issues and the moving and the selling of the bakery. There's so much going on that you finding this DNF as sort of a, it's not a setback. It's just another thing. It's such a nice, enlightening way to to look at these things. Because, listen, a majority of our viewers are going to experience a DNF at some point. And if we can all look at them not as character-defining moments, but more as, like, opportunities, um, I don't know. I think we'll, we're all richer because of it. And therapy. And thank you and for therapy. even just yeah. saying that. And therapy. Like... <laughs> And therapy. <laughs> I I love that this was the story that you were able to share after this race because 40 miles with everything that's been going on, especially in that week leading up to the race, that's amazing. Um, 
and I can't wait to see to see what's next. Uh, any any words for our viewers who might experience a DNF or find themselves faced with the the decision themselves? Um. Well, I think there's one thing. There was a comment on my Instagram that I really like. Um, that is adjacent to that. It's from Catra Corbett, who has run like I think she said like 147 like hundred milers, like some All of ridiculous them. Yeah. number. <laughs> yeah. Right? She's uh, done them like she does them every weekend, and she's like, part of the reason why we do this is because we don't know what the outcome's going to be, right? Like, part of this the reason why we gravitate toward these distances is the unknown, right? And so part of the plethora of options that are available to us in the unknown is not making it to the finish line, right? Like that is a reality of this. And if you do this for long enough, right, you will have a DNF. Like that is like, I know that the old school mentality in our sport is like, I pride myself on not having a DNF and I'm like, Okay. Like I don't, I don't think that that, that mentality serves our community anymore because like, I agree. Like, yeah, I think it takes a whole hell of a lot of guts to show up on the start line and undertake these distances. And like, that should be applauded. Like you went through the training, you signed up for this endeavor and like you had to make an extremely hard choice, right? Like, I think it's funny to kind of like think that Anybody who DNFs is out there just like, yeah, cool. I spent $2,000 on an Airbnb and $500 on a plane and, <laughs> you know, flew all my friends out here. And now I'm just going to like be like blase and like DNF for no reason. Like that is n never anybody, like n not how people make this choice. So it's like you're in a position you have to make a hard choice. It is a hard choice. Like the options are probably like suffering and like disappointment. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like if, yeah. You're done, if you were in the position of choosing to DNF, you're not like, oh, I have extreme elation on one hand or like this really <laughs> sucky, like what if situation <laughs> on the other. Like, like you had to make a hard choice and like, like you have to applaud yourself, like making, like having the courage to say like, I can't do this. Like that takes courage. Right. Because everybody around you is going, oh, just keep going. Just eat a Snickers bar. You'll be fine. Right. Like it, it's like, I think it's just being like, one, it's okay to feel bad, but two, you don't need to make it into like, I feel bad. And in order to make myself feel better, I will judge myself because yeah. I think that that's the process is like sitting with disappointment. We want to be like, well, if I just was stronger or tougher or ran more miles or did this thing or had a different thing for dinner. Yes. You know, like we want to like explain away the disappointments, like, just be disappointed and like leave all the other stuff somewhere else. And like, obviously like with your coach or your friends or whatever, you can have a postmortem and take away the bits like, yeah. Hey, I know a great strategy. Next time don't trip on that rock. Right. Like, like <laughs> what take the, like what lessons can you take forward? But like, you don't need to be like, you know, sitting in self judgment and like make yourself feel worse. Yeah, totally. I think there's inevitably lessons to pull from it and things you can learn from it. I did from mine. Mm -hmm. And I think there was, there was a space for that disappointment. There was like, okay, you'd be bummed, right? Cause you came out here with the goal of finishing hundred miles or whatever the distance is. Yeah. You can be bummed. You're allowed that you're you have some grace. But I think what we're talking about here is that it's not, yeah, it's not defining who you are. You are still the same person with the same goals. And as Deb says here in the chat, did you have that comment? Uh, uh, yeah. If you don't have a DNF, then you have some more challenges ahead of you to try. hundred percent. Um, I love this conversation, Devin. I, uh, am reluctant to, to wrap up the show only because we, <laughs> we did go along tonight and I or did not expect it to, but a part of me is like, I just could sit here and talk with Devin about this for yeah. a long time. I think what we should I do have the tendency to go on and on forever too. Well, we all, so do we. I mean, we love to hear ourselves yeah, talk. Yeah, and there's comments in the chat room just saying that they're, like, really enjoying Devin's storytelling. 100%. And, yeah. Yeah, you're always an audience favorite, Devin, and, and we just love having you on the show. <laughs> I think what we will do, though, is go to our after show. So if those uh, those of you who are watching live or in the archive would like to watch uh, more of this conversation, and we are definitely going to ask Devin about her shirt. There's been a lot of chat about the shirt in the chat room and somebody has already found it and I think is possibly purchasing it. And she's a teacher. She's like, I, I mean, need to teach in you, that shirt. 
You can get it in a onesie if you want, apparently. <laughs> oh, she, knowing the knowing Heather in the chat, she's definitely going to get it in a onesie yeah. and teaching it. <laughs> um, we're going to wrap up our main show here with Devin Yanko talking about her DNF at Havelina this last uh, weekend, the Havelina 100. I do want to just take a quick second uh, to recognize the top three men and women of that race because it really was just a bonkers field and really cool to, to watch. Camille Heron with the new... Um, course record was amazing to watch. Brittany Peterson with second place and Tessa Chesser with third place female. On the male side, we have Arlen Glick, uh, Ryan Montgomery, which is really cool. He has the current unsupported FKT on mm -hmm. the Mount Rainier Wonderland Trail, which is really neat. And Cole Watson oh. coming in third place. So congrats to the top three men and women and the golden tickets. All very cool. Want to make sure that we recognize them tonight. Uh, Devin, where can people follow up with you, follow your adventures, uh, your adventures now that you have a storage box a pod? A pod. And there was a question in the main show. Just There was a question asking if you coach and if you do coach, are you taking clients? And your podcast. Where I can do, they find that? I do. Yes, I do coach. Uh, I coach with Chosky Collective. Um, but if you want to find that information, you can come to my Instagram, which is Fast Foodie. Um, my podcast is Women of Distance, which I co-host with Allison Nanny. And we are currently bad podcast hosts because <laughs> we're like, uh, yeah, let's uh, coordinate. Well, you take your kids to school and I pack up my life and what? No. But um, so Instagram is the best way. I also have a blog and I have restarted blogging. Um I just haven't told any about it, but about the blogs that I've written in part because I took a very strong stance on um, UTMB and the courts program um, in my <laughs> latest post, but that's just my name, Devin Yanko, um, dot com. So those are the main places. And on Strava, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know what to do, viewers. Go show Devin some love. Thank you for being on the show. And, and thank you for tuning in tonight. We do like to end our episodes by recognizing members of the community who go above and beyond. We call it our GR crew member of the week. Kim, you have pulled someone across uh, or across, across the line to the GR the crew line. member winning circle. Who is our GR crew member of the week? Uh, yeah, this week's GR crew member of the week is Yasa. And Yasa is a longtime GR crew member. Uh, Yasa Ronan said, in the midst of the home reno, doing a big home reno right big now, one, yep. in the midst of the home reno and dragging the boys away from their home from weeks, it was great to pin a bib on this little trooper's chest and pace him during the 1K kids run in our hometown. So it was one of his little kiddos that ran the 1K. And he also went on to say, we had lots of fun. He did great and even took one minute, 20 seconds off his 2019 course best excellent congratulations yasa well, or yasa's son, yasa's son uh yeah. for being this week's gr crew member we appreciate your support yasa and i i still owe yasa an email actually yasa's going to help us out with some gif magic Ooh. a lot a lot of uh gift stuff happening uh that's going to wrap up our main show here 376 episodes of ginger runner live in the pocket uh devin yanko is going to join us in our after show if you would like to join us go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner all tiers get access to our after show so we'll see you over there Thanks, all. Get Thanks out there. Everyone. Train hard, race harder, and party hardest. We'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. Ginger Runner.